that worked we had a different uh different way to load the intro here in the beginning so if you just saw a black screen i apologize but i think it worked uh, oh it i didn't. saw it. that was really cool <laughs> okay cool as long as it worked <laughs> haven't tried to do it that way it was supposed to be a little cleaner than the old way we did it all righty um thanks everybody for watching uh tonight is episode 203 of the growing with fish or sorry 307 because my brain is just not working tonight um <laughs> of the Growing With Fishes podcast. Uh, tonight we have Queen of the Sun Grown. Uh, thanks for joining us this evening. Hello, thank you for having me. We also have Wes Engine who just joined us last minute. He'll be uh, here with us in a second, I'm sure. Uh, and I'm your host as always, uh, Stephen Raisner uh, from Poem Ponics. Um, thanks for watching everybody. Uh, we have a really fun show for you guys today. Um, if you have, a, I guess, a couple of house cleaning notes real quick. Um, oops, I got everything all set up wrong here. Hold on guys. There we go. Sorry, trying to change things up, make the show a little cleaner and stuff, and uh, it's still a little clunky on my side. Um, don't forget to check out our other show, Dat Smoke Show, uh, every Wednesday night uh, at 7 o'clock Pacific. We had a pretty awesome time last night, as you can see by the awesome uh, Dutch Blooms meme there. Um, so come check it out. We had uh, Brendan Rust on last night, Wes, um, Wes Engine, Chad Westport, uh, London from FP FCP, and a whole bunch of other great people. So definitely check it out. Um, we also have the uh, aquaponic cannabis class over apmjclass.com. We do have a full length class. We're also doing a Labor Day sale. Use code LABOR, L A B O R, uh, for 75 bucks off the class. If you're looking to save a couple bucks and you want to sign up, uh, uh, now's a great time. Again, Labor Day weekend through the uh, Tuesday after Labor Day at 420, uh, code LABOR for 75 bucks off. We also have the apmjclass.com. I'm sorry, wrong one. Uh, the pestclass.com. Um, and if you're looking for aquaponic pest uh, and living soil pest control, uh, of course. Uh, and then don't forget our open nutrient project. We do have a wide range of uh, open source nutrients, including pages with all of your different nutrients that you need um, from various plant sources. So if you're making your own composts, uh, teas, ferments, whatever, um, you got everything there with links back to the source material. If you want to click that and go to it, you can. Uh, it takes you back to where we source the information. We also have water testing resources and a whole bunch more as well as open source um, forms and uh, access to what other people are getting results for their ferments. So definitely check it out. It's a really cool website, uh, adding new features to it every couple a week or two as I have time to, to add more energy to it. So definitely check it out if you're looking for more resources on your own organic inputs. Uh, today we have a, a great expert on a whole wide range of different organic topics, uh, Queen of the Sun Grown. Um, she's an awesome person. I had a chance to hang out with her twice here in the last month, once in Oklahoma and once in Washington. Um, so it's been a good time. In fact, I got some of her ros uh, rosin here in front of me. Um, wonderful stuff. Uh, you can check it out. Really good stuff here. Uh, good smoke. Definitely give uh, a chance to, uh, if you get a chance to smoke some of her stuff, definitely check it out. Um, she also teaches courses as well with um, uh, Jordan River. Um, be sure to check that out. She's been educating a ton of people on uh, living soil and soil biology and all kinds of other wonderful grow topics. Uh, definitely check out their courses. I know they have uh, a bunch of different um, classes coming up. Uh, they have one there in September in Denver. Uh, they got one coming up in San Diego in October. They got another one coming up in Buffalo, New York. So definitely uh, getting around the country and training everybody around. So um, yeah, uh, awesome. thanks for joining us today. Brad. Yeah, being traveling the country and talking to people in real life has been like so amazing to connect outside of the metaverse, outside of the screen and smoke together and exchange microorganisms. It's been awesome. Inoculating the country with my microbes. <laughs> um, uh, why don't you tell us a little about yourself and, and the, your, your various um... Uh, things that you do. I know you do education and consulting and you do these in-person classes and all kinds of other cool stuff. Yeah, definitely. So um, I've been growing commercially for the last six years. Um, I was one of the first licensed cannabis farms in Nevada County, California when they went rec. Um, 
RIP Prop 215. That was uh, the fun days back during medical. Um, but recently I moved to Washington State and have transitioned from commercial production to education and just getting down to the nitty gritty of helping cultivators large and small. I have commercial consultant clients in Oklahoma. I've helped people in South Africa. I just like to help people grow the dopest dope you ever smoked as clean as possible and as cheap as possible with prices coming down like crazy. Like the biggest thing you can do is reduce your overhead. And in turn, that's going to be like more sustainable, not only for your economics, but it's going to be more sustainable for the earth and, you know, your community and all that. So been really cool to connect with people and help growers just do things a little bit more efficiently. So, yeah, I mean, I have a background in environmental science. Um, I have a degree in natural science. I'm a UC Davis trained master gardener. Um, so I just love growing outside, closed loop. I love animals. So any way to incorporate. Um, I love that you use fish and the whole aquaponics things. I love fishing. I actually worked for a fish biologist for a couple of years. So um, really cool. I'd love to get into aquaponics someday um, so I could harvest my own like cod and tilapia and things like that as well as use their nutrients, use their poo. Do you eat the fish? Oh yeah. Well, it depends on the client. So for, for most of the cannabis people, they're just looking to turn a profit. So they're mostly doing butterfly koi just because it's the, the best return for inch gain. Um, but you know, just if you're straight looking at it from a money perspective, but, um, uh, there are some pretty cool exotic fish that you can grow as well for profits, but most of the time people are, are either, um, just doing koi or they're growing something like tilapia or something else that's easy and pretty tolerant and, uh, donating it for tax purposes or other, you know, uh, uh, uh you know, philanthropic, um, purposes as well. Um, so, uh, I know I had a chance to sit in on a part of your talk at my silly at the festival, um, uh, I guess, uh, first off, how did you like it? Uh, that was a really cool festival that we were both at uh, out in Washington. Yeah, that was amazing. I was just blown away by the venue. I mean, the forest was beautiful. The mushrooms were growing everywhere. I don't know if you had a chance to really explore, but they had like 15 horses and an archery range and like a BMX racetrack and all kinds of cool stuff. I went out and hiked for like an hour and didn't run into a single person it's like wow well this is a unique festival usually festivals are like crowded and overwhelming my social anxiety and this was like my kind of jam it was great <laughs> yeah it was cool that all the different workshops were very spread out there were some in outdoor uh, classrooms some in indoor classrooms it was like a really cool mix of all different types of things as far as homesteading, mostly around mushroom cultivation and foraging and things like that. But also the, you know, permaculture, Matt Powers was there. Uh, Chris Trump was there. Uh, they had a guy doing meat processing. They had a guy doing alcohol processing and, and, you know, how that entails with mushrooms and all kinds of other cool stuff. So it was, it was a super neat festival. Um, I had a chance to sit down on a part of yours and you did a, a lot of talk on um, how microbes affect terpenes. And I was kind of hoping maybe you could talk to us a little bit about that because um, we've often talked about it on the show as far as uh, in relation to healthy living soil and aquaponics, but I'd love to kind of hear your take on that. And, and uh, you had a really cool presentation. I'd love for you to, to tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, thank you. Um, so basically, I'm encouraging everyone to increase their biodiversity in their homes, in their farms, in their lives, in their cannabis garden, uh, not only... Um, because it's better for the environment. Obviously, our, our biodiverse hotspots are the most thriving ecosystems in the world. Um, but like they said in the sustainable business talk, when you have a diversity of um, products or commodities that you produce, it is more secure financially if you're a farmer um, and you're not relying on just this one crop. So that's another aspect of increasing your diversity. And then what that talk at Mycelia was specifically about was really the other angle that biodiversity increases terpene production. And this is because terpenes are the language of plants, right? I mean, 
uh, plants communicate using terpenes to talk to other plants, to talk to pollinators, to talk to pests, and to talk to microbes. Um, so really we discussed like, you know, all of these different terpenes, like linalool specifically is for plant to plant communication. So if you want to increase your levels of linalool, which is like found in blueberry muffin or other florally strains, um, you can plant other plant species that are high in it, like lavender, um, and they'll communicate with each other and increase those levels. Um, limonene is a really cool terpene because it's like, you know, that uplifting citrusy terpene. Um, and I grew some lemon meringue last year, outdoor, native soil, super biodiverse, you know, with lemon balm growing around it, calm free, sweet alyssum, buckwheat, nasturtiums, like I, I love all of the plants. So there it's out there, you know, around everything. And I lived in a neighborhood where there was like every single property had a hundred foot greenhouse, a thousand plants and aphids everywhere. Hemp aphids were crazy. And I didn't have any aphids on the lemon meringue. And it was amazing because limonene increases when there's pest pressure. Um, I gave the same cut to a homie in Oklahoma and he grew it inside with no pest pressure, no biodiversity. And I smoked it literally the exact same plant. Like I gave him that cut. And I didn't even know it was lemon meringue. It had hardly any lemon terps. None of the limonene came through. I was like, whoa, like you couldn't even walk into my house without being like overwhelmed with this lemon cleaner scent. And his weed was just like, oh, is, this is what there's lemon in here. This there's limonene. And so it was really cool to just see like that the biodiversity, that it was working, that it was communicating, it was doing all of these things that we read about, but to experience it firsthand is just like, that uh, gets my juices flowing. <laughs> so. You see the, the inverse too, so, uh, or not the inverse, but you also see this with people that are converting traditional farms to cannabis. I know in Oklahoma, we've seen quite a bit where people took a corn field or wheat field or a, a cattle field that they were spraying with 2D4 or 2,4-D or whatever it is, or any of these other broadleaf herbicides. And there's no microbiology. You put it under a microscope, there's nothing there. They're just dead because they've been treating them with all these other stuff. Um, so, uh, or the fields were just monocropped to, to, to hell for the last 50 years or whatever. So um, those fields are always the ones we end up with these septoria outbreaks and the botrytis and the, those mold issues because the plants have no reference in the root system. How's the plant going to know how to defend itself against molds or, or fungi or anything if it doesn't have access to any, you know, why would it waste the energy to, to create those secondary metabolites if it doesn't think it needs to defend itself against them? Yeah, exactly. And specifically, caryophylline is one that has a unique relationship with mycorrhizal fungi. And so fungus will actually produce caryophylline and they'll um, have this relationship, right? With the roots. And when there is like drought stress in a plant and it's inoculated with this mycorrhizal fungus, it will increase its caryophylline levels and the fungus will increase its levels. And then if there's a good, healthy mycelial network, the mushrooms, the fungus will be like, yo, there's a drought coming. There isn't enough resources. And it will tell every other plant species with that specific terpene by sending it through the mycelial network and letting them know, yo, be prepared. There isn't enough water. And when you don't have these microorganisms, you don't have bacteria, you don't have fungus, you don't have nematodes, nematodes, protozoa. It's like, there's just like this huge disconnect in life. And so many things are missing. Like you said, I'm botrytis comes in, fusarium comes in. I mean, it's just amazing how much is happening without like us seeing it. And that's why living soil is king. That is why biodiversity is important. That is why I should say queen here. <laughs> um, but really, it's just, it's a way of life. And we've, we've separated ourselves out as humans to be so reductionist, like, no, we want to extract, 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 and we're going to learn so much about one thing and then not pay attention to how everything is connected, right? It's all 
has a purpose. It's all communicating, even if we don't know it. And really like, that's what I wanted people to get was that terpenes. Yes, they're great for having that loud weed, the smell, but they have intrinsic value. Everything has intrinsic value. And that is just value for simply existing, for doing its own job in nature, in an ecosystem. And the other thing that I found really cool, and I think it was last year, or maybe it was the first part of this year, there's a white paper out now on cannabis about growing non-cannabis plants that are high in terpenes, um, just like you're talking about with the, the aerosol effect of that aerosolized terpenes triggering increased terpene production in, in, in the cannabis. That's why I love to grow with things like thyme, oregano, basil, you know, stuff that is already pretty immune to most insects and not going to get things as easily, but also providing those uh, uh, aromatics is going to help stimulate your, your plants more. And not to mention time is highly, uh, in terms of, of her, uh, medicinal herbs or kitchen herbs, the one that has the biggest overlap, at least documented overlap in terms of mycorrhizal species with cannabis. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. I'm so happy yeah. to learn something. Um, and people ask me all the time because I'm a huge companion plants, inter uh, nursery plant, whatever you want to call it, cover cropping. I love diversity in species. I mean, that's permaculture, right? Like high density species in a small area. And they ask me like, what should I plant? And I'm like, look at what bottles you're using that you like, like plant therapy or Canatrol from Mammoth Pea or whatever it is. Look at the back and what oils are in there? What are they using? What essential oils? Peppermint, thyme, geranium, um, like rosemary, all of these things. Although rosemary, I always get spider mites on my rosemary. So I try not to bring the rosemary near. Um, but yeah, like plant experiment. And what do you like to eat? Like, don't just plant it just because you want to protect your plant, but like overlay and connect all of these things that's like the best way that you're going to save money and just be more immersed and more have more care and more thought if you really like to cook with oregano or thyme then you should probably plant that and if you're using a bottled ipm product that has that why aren't you growing it oh yeah i couldn't agree more <laughs> We also have uh, Wes Engine joined us now. He's got everything hooked up. We'll do a quick intro. What's up, Wes? What's going on, Potent? How's it going, Queen of the Suns? Hey, enjoying... what's up, Wes? Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you as well. Just enjoying your talk there about terpenes. And uh, I, I, didn't under, I didn't realize that they exchanged them through the mycorrhizal fungus. I thought that terpenes only went through the air, but I was, uh, I've learned something new today as well. So thank you. Yay, we're all learning. I love that. What a great night. If everyone can learn something new and literally like that should be everyone's goal every day. Learn one thing new, right? Absolutely. Um, is there any other cover crop species that you're a big fan of uh, in particular? Um, buckwheat. I love buckwheat and sweet alyssum. Those two are um, buckwheat for one depending on what zone gardening zone you're in, um, you can grow it and harvest and cut down like up to four times in one season. Um, and it just keeps reseeding itself. Parasitic wasps love it. And I love parasitic wasps. They just, they work caterpillars and aphids and, um, they're just great to have in your ecosystem. Uh, you can make like buckwheat pancakes or, um, do like sprouted seed teas with them. And so it has multi uses. They're pretty and they add a lot of biomass. So you can cut them back in between. Like I was doing, you know, three harvests in my greenhouses and they would grow back within each cycle so that I could cut them down and incorporate the green biomass before replanting so that they got that nitrogen boost. Um, so buckwheat's great. And then sweet alyssum is hardy. Uh, you can step on it. You can throw your tarps on it from light depping and they'll bounce right back. Um, and they bring in lace wings like no other. Like I've never bought a beneficial insect. I just plant what they like. And I literally had like hundreds and thousands of lace wings after I planted sweet alyssum. Um, when we were harvesting the outdoor, it was just like waves of these 
freaking amazing, beautiful little green insects flying off. And in fact, I was like sampling some pounds of ice cream cake to some brokers and they opened it up and freaking lace wings flew out. And I was like, that's embarrassing, but it's still so really cool. <laughs> so those two, uh, definitely always have those, uh, calm freeze, like, you know, great. I get w wary of it because it is so like, once you plant it, it's there forever and it can, I'm like all about native species. So unless you have like a really nice permaculture designed garden that you know that you're going to have it there and it's not disrupting the ecosystem in any way by spreading and out competing native species, I'm just careful with that. But it's also great for producing a lot of biomass and people like to ferment it and make all kinds of cool things with it. Um, it's supposed to like heal your bones or something. That's what people back in the day used it for, poultices. I got my room in bed. <laughs> covered Sorry, it. I didn't interrupt you. <laughs> there we go. Um, so yeah, I mean, whatever, whatever really nasturtiums I liked at first until I realized they bring in the dreaded cabbage moth, the imported cabbage moth, which lays those little eggs underneath the surface of those leaves and produces little bud worms that create bud rot. So I now use nasturtiums in just my like vegetable garden. Um, and then it's great to attract the cabbage moths there instead of having them because they really like brassicas. So you can get them to go to the nasturtiums instead of like your kale or broccoli or things like that. Also, uh, never plant brassicas with your cannabis. Many brassica species will uh, uh, excrete exudates that kill mycorrhizae. Oh, interesting. I wonder. I wonder why they don't like. Um, well, I guess you know wild mustard does the allelo chemicals. That's what you're talking about. And so I took this class on conservation of natural resources. And if you plant wild mustard, which is like the, uh, the precursor to almost all domesticated brassicas. So you've got your wild mustard and you t it turns into everything, cabbage, uh, what are those little tiny cabbage, Brussels sprouts, broccoli, um, all of that comes from wild mustard. And if you plant wild mustard next to apple trees, um, the allelo chemicals that you're talking about will actually ward off a lot of other um, plants that like the same nutrients or require the same nutrients as apple trees. And they've seen like up to 50% more um, growth in apple yields when companion planted together. So I thought that was really cool. Okay, you brought up the, can I see that again? I can't hear you. Here we go. Okay, degrade mycorrhizal mutualism in its soil, promote abundance of microbial pathogens. Dang. That's so interesting. I wonder why. I wonder what its intrinsic value and why it's, um, you know, doesn't want mycorrhizal fungi. There's a whole paper out by uh, the state of California, the state of West Virginia, a bunch of different states. Um, uh, Department of Natural Resources have done this because it wipes out native uh, plants that need specific mycorrhizae. Uh, Interesting. And in California, it's real bad. Yeah, there's just huge fields of mustard in California that are not planted or cultivated. They're just wild, well, not really wild, but they are just in taking over invasives. Oh, it's beautiful though. And was it May or April when it blooms? Oh yeah, it is. I actually have like pictures with my little brother out in the mustard fields when it's all blooming. It's quite a sight to see. Also, the nice thing about brassicas is those aphids really don't like cannabis much when they jump to it. So, thankfully. Oh, yeah. And people will like pull out their plants that are like invaded with aphids. And I'm like, yo, leave them. Like, let the aphids 
the aphids are going to be there. If you leave the brassicas and you leave the things that, that they prefer over the cannabis, then um, they're not going to go for your cannabis. And I believe that 10% of your garden should go back to the earth. It's just like you're tithing 10% of everything you have should be going to whether it's mother nature or helping other people who, who can't help themselves or less fortunate, whatever it is. If it's an aphid, it's an aphid. We had a question from chat. Uh, if you guys didn't have a lot of space in the garden and could only interplant one species with ganja, what would it be? Hmm, one, that's very hard to choose just one. Well, hmm, I would probably say sweet alyssum. What about you, Steve? I, uh, I would probably, <laughs> excuse me, probably do a little mix of like different times. Probably, probably the one, you know, go with a lemon time and then like, maybe a creeping time and maybe like a orange time or something, try to get some diversity in that terpenes expression with the time. Plus it does well. One. <laughs> oh yeah, I know. Um, creeping time probably if, if I had to pick a singular species. Okay, cool. Wes, what about you? More ganja. More, More ganja. ganja. <laughs> Uh, honestly, I don't really uh, do much with uh, cover crops. I've had uh, I, when I've ran them before, I've ran like uh, 12 seed blends with like uh, buckwheat and uh, clover and all that kind of good jazz in it. But um, I had I had problems with when I got pests. The pests were happy to move down to the clover and then it became uh, just an ongoing fight with them. So I got rid of my cover crops in, indoors for that reason. Yeah, I've heard that often with clover and I've actually never used clover um, as a cover crop. It's kind of like one of those things that I think of as a true cover crop that should be planted like overwintering kind of a thing. Um, if I was to choose a nitrogen fixing companion crop to plant alongside cannabis, I would probably go with cow peas over um, clover. They're also nitrogen fixers, but it takes, I mean, if you're trying to use a cover crop to fix atmospheric nitrogen, like you actually have to cut it back when it's about 50% flower. You can't just let it go and go because it will just take the nitrogen that it fixed and store it in its seeds. So I see a lot of people um, doing that and not cutting it back in time. Hi puppy. <laughs> it was like the disappearing act. <laughs> um, aw, so cute. Oh, I would, uh, I would also advise against putting clover in your garden. I've seen it be white flies and spider mites in particular love clover. So uh, it was spider mites for me. Yeah, that's why I don't I don't like those. Uh, again, I like stuff. Think of it this way. You want stuff that you you'd use in the kitchen, something that's really flavorful and really terpy. That's what you want to put in as companion plants to have the best luck. The other one I've seen that people do a lot of and have a lot of problems with is marigolds. Marigolds that come from nurseries very, very often have spider mites on them that are just at a controlled level and not at an exterminated level. Same thing with uh, strawberries. If you get strawberry starts from the store, you should dip them in self oil X or something like that. It, 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 some kind of sterilization dip, whatever, or other mineral oil doesn't really matter, but that's the one that, that is, uh, you know, it, it's approved for use in most states for cannabis. So that's a good one, uh, at least for that, you know, try to stick to stuff that's on the white list uh, whenever possible. Yeah, Monterey has a really affordable horticultural oil that I like to use. And I'm pretty sure that there it's, on all of those lists as well. They just have a lot of the same products that they'll carry and just do um, a much more affordable than what is like Sephoil X, Moltex. That's like the, the more expensive premium. I don't know, what is that? Bio something, whatever their company is, but. Bioworks, yeah. Bioworks, by the way, if you ever have to work with Bioworks, Bioworks is amazing. Like, so if you ever buy a, if you're a commercial producer and you buy products for them, 
um, they'll call you like a week or two after you do it and ask you if you have any questions on use rates, if you're having success, you're not having success, if you need advice on how to use the product better. Like they are, um, their customer service is amazing. Well, um, but is this the one you're talking about? Yeah, it's like the same thing, but like a quarter of the price. Cheaper. I think. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah but a bottle of stuff OX is like a hundred bucks, but this is uh, about yeah. seventeen bucks. So much better for the home user. That's great. I didn't I didn't know that there was a an equivalent product that was at that kind of price point. That's wonderful. Yeah, I'm all about trying. That's like one of my biggest things is finding what everyone is recommending and using, and then finding a cheap alternative that you can get. Oftentimes, um, cannabis products have the green tax associated with them, but uh, most agricultural products are commodities where they aren't getting a huge return. And agriculture has been around for, what do we say, like 15,000 years. We've been really been working on um, all of these products for a long time. And so there's usually great alternatives um, one that I recommend all the time is uh, custom biologicals. If you are in an indoor setting or you need to kick boost um, your microbial life and you like buying micro products instead of IMOs or composting, um, check out custom biologicals. They have um, little 50 milliliter bottles for like $27, $30, and it treats like 10 acres, like 2.5 hectares, because they're for um, large scale agricultural, um, you know, producers. And so they have like all of the bacillus strains that are found in like all of the expensive, heady cannabis products. Um, yep, there I we go. And they make all different kinds. So, you know, like different bioremediation, the septic, but they have like, yeah, their agricultural line. And so you can get like trichoderma and bacillus and free form nitrogen fixer, like pan or cyanobacteria, I think. So um, that's really great for commercial growers. If you, like you're saying in Oklahoma, where you have, you know, these fields that were once corn, soy, wheat, whatever, and heavily pesticide use, and there's no life, and you want to spray the entire field, this can help kickstart and treat something like 10 acres at a time instead of, you know, these little bottles that treat 180 gallons of water or something. That's great. That's really cool. Yeah, they have terrible customer service though. So if you're looking for <laughs> somebody to answer questions, I I have been trying to get a hold of them forever because they say on their website they do white labeling, and so I was like, oh, cool! I can. You, why don't you make me a blend of microbes for me, and I can, you know, queen of the sun microbes for the cheap, like the low low. And never have I once been able to get through on the phone or get an email back. And I mean, just look at their website. It looks like it was made in 2006. So um, just great value for the product. And it works really well, though. Like you literally put like a drop, like a half of a milliliter in like my 250 gallon reservoir. Like that's how potent this stuff is. That's great. Potent conics. <laughs> um pull up my questions here um so you do a lot of work as well with worms and worm castings and worm teas do you want to talk a little bit about that because you got a lot of great content on that oh sure yeah that was actually my introduction to teaching gardening was worms i would go to the farmer's market um once a month and teach a children's um worm class i actually did it at the county fair as well and kids love worms so that's a great way to get kids involved in gardening and sustainable sustainability and reducing our waste because 40% of all of the landfills could be composted at home. And if you don't want the work of a thermophilic compost pile, worm composting or vermicomposting is like the easiest, most simple way to just start a compost pile. So if I could do anything in the world, it's just to like, get you to start a compost pile of any sort. And I have start, I have gotten so many people onto composting. Um, Mr. Grow It, 
I did an episode with him and I just did another one like a year, like it was a year ago. I did one. And then I did one a few weeks ago and he was like, I started a worm bin because of you. And I just was like, wow, my life is like, has a meaning now. <laughs> um, worms are just so cool. I mean, they are both male and female. You need two of them to reproduce though. Um, they consume like three times their body weight in a day or something. They can reproduce at such a fast rate. They can survive from like 30 degrees to, they say 90, but I've let my worms get up to like 130 on accident and they were fine. Um, I mean, they have little gizzards like chickens and they grind their food down. They breathe through their skin. How cool is that? That's why you got to keep your worms moist, right? Because they need that permeability of their skin to breathe through. Um, their poop is like stronger, like stronger in a way. How do I say this? Everything in life, right, is like the law of physics is anytime you do something, you lose energy. You never get more out of something than you put in. But with worms, for some reason, their poop is stronger than what goes into them, like their NPK levels. When you test, like uh, if they ate lettuce or something and the NPK levels of the lettuce, and then you tested the worm poop, it would be stronger coming out. And I don't know how this, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense to me. It blows my mind. I just don't get it. Um, and they increase the cation exchange capacity of soil, which is really great. If you understand soil science and you're like, trying to, you know, those electrons are out there. I, I could go down a whole nother road with that, but um, worms are freaking awesome. Definitely, you should get a worm. Bed. Do, do you have worms? Normally keep worms, yeah, but I just, <clears throat> because I'm moving next month, I got everything torn down now. Um, so they're, okay. they got released to the garden in the front yard, but. <laughs> yeah. We did have I them before that. I've They're got worms. Great. You've got worms. Yay, we've I've all got, got worms. worms. <laughs> <laughs> they, they also get rid of E. coli. So if you have E. coli in the soil, their gut gets rid of it, the microbes that live within them. And it's, it's a great way for mitigating soil pathogens as well because their, their microbiome is just so good at dealing with all that stuff. That's amazing. Yeah, I mean, they will literally like break down all kinds of things and they're just amazing little creatures. And if you like fishing, hey, free bait right there. You don't gotta stop at the gas station before you go fishing. I mean, you don't have to, do you fish? Oh yeah. Oh yeah, okay, yeah. I mean, you must love fish, right? Like oh, yeah. <laughs> your, your brand is growing with fishes, so. Especially in Oklahoma, they, uh, there's a lot of really good beef cuts in the grocery stores, but not uh, anything other than catfish. Is, uh, pretty hard to come by unless you catch it yourself uh, i've had a, a friend out there who told me that most of the fish he was catching was um infested with parasites though so he would have to um soak the fish in salt water and then all of the worms and stuff would come out of the fish so um that's a little i don't like worms in that case <laughs> Yeah, no, that works yeah. really well though. Uh, you take them and you put them in. We used to do saltwater dips for freshwater fish and freshwater dips for saltwater fish back in the pet shop. And it works really good, especially for flukes and worms and uh, things like that. The, it, it, the difference in, in um, uh, salinity really screws with them pretty, you know, within a minute or two, it kills them. And the big fish can survive five or 10 minutes uh, in the other, other water just fine. Oh, wow. So they're alive when you would do that. Yeah, yeah. So you, you'd catch them and dip them in there. I, I guess it depends on the fish and how long you're doing it. But yeah, in general. So another cool trick you can do. So and we I, when we used to teach classes at the aquaponics source. We used to do this once in a while, depending on like the squeamishness of the class that we were teaching. But if it was someone we wanted to have fun or if you're ever teaching a class and you want to really screw with your students, you can do this. So if you have a really fresh fish, so if you take a fish out, especially if you ikijima it or uh, ikiri it, um, where you do an Iki gun, where you, um, there's a great product actually. If you're into fishing, uh, let me show you something that's great, especially if you're into spear fishing. 
I've uh, never been, but I would really love to. So, um, yeah, so this is the this is the it, this thing is amazing if you're into fishing. So this is basically like a cattle prod for fish. Um, so you basically put it up to their temple and pull the trigger and uh, their lights are out. So they go from being awake to not being awake anymore. Instantly. Okay. So I oh. just usually put huh. my knife in the back of their head, but this is like instant. You don't have to yep. actually do the pressure of piercing another animal's skull and brain. You can just yeah. allow the gun to do it itself. It doesn't work for big catfish, but it works on everything else. That's cool. How much is it? Um, they're like, it's like 80 bucks. Ah, well, it's ah. a, a 80 bucks in New Zealand. I don't know what that is. It's dollary dues. So I don't know what it is in America. I bought one and had it shipped to, to the States. So. Okay, cool. I mean, no more bludgeoning. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, uh, those are great. So if you have a fish and you pull it out and it's live and you kill it real quick or just cut the head off real fast and the, the tissue is still pretty, you know, within five or 10 minutes of you killing this fish. You can take and uh, make up a, a separate little buck, like um, stay in, you know, a bowl with super, super briny water and a washcloth or two in there, like a clean washcloth, and make sure they soak up that super briny uh, water, like cold briny water. And you put your fillets there, and then you like clean the table, and then you wipe your hands, and then you grab the salty briny one, and you put it on it so it touches the the fillet. The fillet will jump because the salinity difference on it will stimulate the nerves and the thing. And it'll actually jump on the, you can make like a skin filet jump on the cutting board table. And, and, uh, gonna, it's pretty wild. That sounds pretty cool. I am going to do that and I will record it and tag you in that. And I will say, <laughs> look what he taught me. Look at what Steve taught me. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's fun for teaching. If you just want to screw with your students and make sure they remember um you do that they'll remember anything you say right around them <laughs> <laughs> I, bet. I, bet. I like i like that kind of fun showmanship and having fun when you're teaching that's always a, a good time oh yeah um, definitely uh, let me pull up the other questions here sorry um uh, you also do a lot of work, uh, microscope work i don't think we've even touched on that um, do you want to tell everybody about that and maybe some of the other cool stuff that they would learn in your class because it, it's definitely one of the cool skills that they learn uh, taking your course yeah. Um, so basically this living soil masterclass is five hours long. It's definitely a lot of information. And we start out with just the basics of soil science, understanding um, how soil is formed, um, looking into your specific geology if you're outside so that you can know what the parent material and how that's going to influence your growing and your structure and your porosity and all of the just nitty gritty and then we start um, going into uh, microbiology and we have everyone bring, well, not everybody, that would take so long, but we usually have like 10 to 15 soil samples and um, everything from indoor potting mix to native soil that hasn't been touched or amended at all to uh, Johnson Sioux supercharged compost and um, basically just, you know, look at everyone's soil and point out, you know, fungal spores and um, fungal hyphae and bacteria, and you get to see how alive your soil really is. Um, definitely lots of protozoa. And it's always exciting when we find a nematode because like in one teaspoon of living soil, you can have like billions of microorganisms, but like 10 to 100 nematodes. So whenever we find a nematode, it's like, just like this exciting adventure, especially if it's still alive and it's like flailing around across the screen. Um, and you, you know, if it's dead, we get to look at its esophagus so we can see what kind of nematode it is because you can determine that by its stylet and the esophagus of what it consumes. Um, same thing with like protozoas, we can look at it and if it has a tail, then it's like a flagellate. If it has little legs, it's a ciliate. If it's got like that eye, it's the amoeba. So it's really cool just showing everyone all the different microorganisms and then like their role in the soil food web and um, 
this is cool. One guy who is super into fish fertilizer and using a lot of aquatic uh, microbe inputs. Um, he, oh, yep, there's their esophagus. A nematode. Nematode or nematode? SpongeBob says nematode. So I kind of like to go with the nematode. But um, anyway, the, what was I saying? Oh, I found in this this soil sample that was uh, very heavy in the, the fish inputs and aquatic inputs, uh, corkscrew shaped microorganism. And I had never seen that in any of the soil samples we had looked at. And it was actually in the spirulum ba uh, bacteria family. And I found out that that is related to syphilis. And it is a nitrogen fixing bacteria that doesn't need a symbiotic relationship with a root zone. It is just floating around, corkscrewing and taking atmospheric nitrogen and fixing it into the soil. And it's associated with really moist and aquatic um, uh, environments. So that was super cool to see that. That was probably like, besides the live action nematodes swimming, swimming across, flailing across the microscope, that was the coolest microbe I've seen for sure. That's awesome. Yep. So that's, you know, what we're doing. We're traveling, literally traveling the country, teaching people like the importance of sustainability in your soil and how you can harness the power of native soil. And it's literally like a savings account when you use native soil versus buying bagged potting mix. There's a huge difference. Potting mix is not soil. Soil is 45% minerals. Minerals are what make up your nutrients. That's why you have to keep adding nutrients to potting mix. Potting mix is just the organic fraction of soil. It's just a tiny part, like five to 10% of soil is organic fraction. And this is where the microorganisms live, but um, it's not the whole picture. And that's why you have to keep spending money, keep spending money. So if you come and spend a hundred bucks in my class, you'll have five hours of learning how to save hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dollars over the course of your growing lifetime. So come check it out. Um, we're only touring the country with the living soil class for probably until like January or February. And then we're switching to IPM. So get it while you can. And we will hopefully have it on, available online at that time, February, January as well. So if you can't make it in person, but you don't get to bring your soil sample when it's online and you don't get to smoke with me. I bring hash to every class. So, you know, there's that and hanging out and doing fun things. It's like just being in person is really, I mean, I have, I'm so happy I had the pleasure to meet you in real life in the beginning of August. And then last weekend we got to hang out together and now we're hanging out together in the metaverse. It's just, it's been great. I'm really glad we've connected. Oh, yeah. And turf float was a great time as well. Uh, anyone that hasn't had a chance to definitely go to turf float in Oklahoma. There's no other event where you can like sit there and just lay in the river all afternoon and then listen to good music and walk, you know, basically smoke anywhere you want. It was really good time. So yeah. That was amazing. I really, I was hoping that I was going to make some money there and I didn't, but it was so much fun that I was like, I don't even care that I didn't make a profit. I basically had a really fun vacation and got to spend some time with some really cool people in a beautiful place. I mean, tripping on mushrooms in that river with the cicadas, like just jamming into my head. I was like, whoa. This is amazing. And the meteor shower, it was the, the Perseoid meteor shower there too. And that night I just sat there in the river and laid up there and looking at the stars. It was wonderful after the, the great Dang. music and everything. It was so good. I didn't even know that the Perseid was going on that night. I didn't even see any meteors. Gosh. Yeah, there was, a, there was like a dozen a minute or so there uh, for a while. It was pretty wild. <laughs> Thing. I should have looked up and that's just like gosh what I love meteor showers and looking at the stars I don't know how I missed that 
must have been worried about all those water moccasins that I was told about that created balls of snakes. And then if you walked on the river floor, there would be snake holes. Someone told me that and I was tripping about the, oh. the snake balls. <laughs> uh, and water moccasins float. They don't sink. So they're one of the few snakes that just floats real easy. Yeah, that's nice. Um, I, I usually, I love snakes. I don't mind um, snakes at all, but I just am not familiar with water moccasins and I'd never heard of snakes being in the bottom of a river that will bite you, but somebody was probably just pulling my leg, you know, trying to, I'm gullible. You tell me something and I really believe it. So Uh, that might've been what happened. I believe that to be somewhat true. I knew a guy that uh, was from like, I think I believe it was Missouri. He came down to Antigua as a uh, working for the U S air force. And he uh, he told me about when he was a kid that one of his friends jumped off the boat and like jumped into a ball of uh, those snakes like that and came up. And he said that they uh, they were hitting and trying to get the snakes off him so hard that they don't know if he didn't know if he 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 was responsible for killing him or the snakes uh, killed his friend. But yeah, it's a crazy story. Wait, you know, the guy died. Yeah. From and they were water moccasins. I think so. That's the, that's the way that the guy described it to me. Oh, this was this is real. Okay, so I wasn't just tripping. Oh my gosh, that's so they, so they do breed in balls, but they breed in balls in the spring. So it was the raw, but and also like they're 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 um they're not going to be on the bottom of the river. They'll be up in a bank in a big pile, mating pile. Okay, yep. crazy. You're safe. Here. You, I'm you do have to watch like the snapping turtles and stuff like that, but they're not very common in the. They don't like rivers. They like ponds and lakes and stuff more. Yeah, that river seemed pretty clean. I've just ne- that was my first time swimming in water that I couldn't see through. Like I lived in Tahoe the last ten years. So that Lake Tahoe, you can see a hundred feet down. It's like crystal clear and the most beautiful, gorgeous water. So going into water that I couldn't see my feet was a little um uncomfortable for me you also have a great video on the microbiometer do you want to tell everybody a little bit about that oh sure um i literally was at um one of my patrons houses in oklahoma so i have a patreon it's a subscription membership basis $10 a month or $100 for the year. And I have all of my low cost savings recipes. Um, Like, you know, I like to do cost comparisons. So I did like the Buddha bloom from Roots Organic. And I got all of the ingredients that were in that and broke it down. And it was like for a large scale commercial cultivator, um, one serving for a 250 gallon reservoir costs like $26. But if you buy all of those ingredients, it's like less than $4 a serving. And so really that's where you can get your ROI and to improve. So that's really what I focus on, like teaching. I write articles, recipes for saving money. And I met um, a gentleman, him and his wife are commercial cultivators in Oklahoma. And I met them at my living soil class and they subscribed to my Patreon and they became like some of my best friends because literally people from Oklahoma are the nicest people I've ever met in my life. And I love Oklahoma. I told my husband, I want to move to Oklahoma because Shane and April are the nicest people. And I just want to be best friends and hang out with them all the time. And I literally went to Turk float with them. I met them at living soil they became my patrons. I'm helping him with his commercial farm. And as I was staying at their house after turf float, he's like, I bought this microbiometer. I don't know how to use it. And I've been kind of scared. Um, I don't know. There was just like a learning curve there. So I'm like, yeah, man, I'll figure this out. So we sat down and I made the video and I was like, this is, if you need help, other people need help with this let me help everyone. So that's what I'm doing on the YouTube, which I am very, very new to YouTube. Like a couple of years ago, I made it, I made one, um, but I didn't have internet for the last two years living on a farm. And so now I have internet again and I started making videos two weeks ago and it's how to use a microbiometer step-by-step. 
um, it's pretty simple. You literally just have to take a soil sample. Um, I mean, watch the video, you can see it. Everybody, if you're there, please subscribe. Um, I'm just trying to have fun and share knowledge, education, and help people save money because money is a key pillar to sustainability. Like there's three pillars. It is the, not only the natural world and in the environment, but it's your community. And it's also the economic impact that it has on you. So saving money is a huge part of that. And um, the microbiometer can help you determine like what you need to do with your soil because it gives you you know, your fungal to bacterial ratio and tells you the, the biomass that is present of these organisms. So not only that ratio, but how much, like what percentage of your soil is microorganisms. So this is good to tell if you have a, you know, healthy soil food web going on and they're doing their job, digesting minerals with enzymes and breaking it down and making it accessible for your plants. Um, it's like $130. I've never used one until that day. Um, I think that they're great baseline testers for a new garden space um, or something that you're working on to convert. You know, maybe you have land that you're trying to turn into uh, permaculture, living, thriving, breathing, living soil. This would be a great tool to incorporate into your tool belt to help you gauge where you started, where you're at, and where you want to go um, in terms of biology and your soil. So really cool. I've never talked to the owners or the company itself, but I'd love to um, get one going for me over here in Washington because I'm in a neighborhood right now. And if you live in a neighborhood, you probably have like very, very little microbial diversity because almost all neighborhoods are like the topsoil is scraped bare to poor foundations and then they just bring in sod that's been like pesticide ridden and so um that'd be a cool tool you know to use in this completely different environment that i've never lived in before and it probably is lacking in microbes and microbes are not only important for your plants but mental health you know they say the bacteria in your gut increases your serotonin levels so if you are um, somebody that suffers from mental illness like i have my whole life have suffered with depression and things like that um you should want more microbes more bacteria around you in your soil in your diet um i'm not saying eat your soil but you know, if a little bit gets under your fingernail and you, you eat something, it's not the end of the world. Also, bacteria kill viruses. So, um, you know, there's that whole aspect as well for your immune system. Um. <laughs> oh, yeah, definitely helpful. Uh, I don't know, a whole wide range of things. Yeah. Microbes, man, fucking awesome. Um, I know that uh, I've yes, started to move a lot. Since I started drinking uh, liquid IMO at least once a month, uh, I certainly have quite a bit of uh, um, improvement on my some of my digestive issues. It seems to definitely have, and also like when I sweat, it doesn't smell anywhere near, like it used to. It's like a much, much less offensive smell, I guess, when I'm sweaty. Wow, you drink your IMOs? What's that? You drink your liquid IMO? How, tell me about yeah. that. Yeah, Chris Trump tricked me into it in January, and then I realized it was helping, and then I've been doing it. I don't know, maybe every month or two, whenever I do a fresh collection, I'll do it. Um, I'll make a liquid IMO after I stabilize it. But basically, you just you know make a liquid IMO from uh, IMO2, and then uh, throw a little bit of that in some water, brew it up for a while, and then drink it. You know, it's not the, or 20, whatever it is, 12 hours or 24 hours. I forget what the, the thing is on the, um, sorry, I'm tired. It's been a long day. I've been in the sun all day, so my brain is just not working. Um. <laughs> well, I'll have to ask uh, Chris about that. Thank you for the introduction. That was sweet. He wrote me afterward and was like, great class. I was like, oh, 
thank you. Made me yeah, feel good. Definitely, uh, the two of you definitely get along well. Uh, he's another good educator and a good friend of the show that comes on here quite regularly. So, um, but definitely, uh, sorry about the dogs in the back. Oh, that's okay. I love dogs. I had four dogs. Now you have like four dogs, right? Yeah, we have four dogs and two cats. Yeah, uh, dogs are awesome. You got all of their microbes around you. I think that oh, yeah. is just like, you know, makes you healthier right there, having the dog microbes. Oh, yeah. Well, they've, they've found that kids that are exposed to dogs have lower cases of asthma and other issues, and all, lower cases of autoimmune diseases as well. Oh, yeah, definitely. One of my favorite farmers, um, Joel Salatin of the Polyface Farm in Virginia, uh, he swears by drinking from the cow's water trough. And he says that that is what boosts his immune system because he gets all of those microbes from his cows. Um, you know? I mean, I guess. I, <laughs> I'm sure. I, I, I don't know that I'm going to be drinking out of a cow trough anytime soon, but. <laughs> but maybe uh, the liquid IMO. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the liquid I'm all I'm down with. I'm, I'm I'm rocking that. I'll do that. I mean, I, yeah. I I I've already seen great results from drinking my labs and stuff, and uh, it helped me from being violently lactose intolerant to being able to have a bowl of ice cream like a normal person, right? And just be mildly uncomfortable, right? Uh, but uh, no, I'm definitely down to try liquid IMO. That's for sure. I'll have to get into that. Yeah, I'll try it. I think we should have a liquid IMO drinking challenge. We should. <laughs> yeah, get together once a month and drink our liquid IMO and make funny faces. Uh huh. Yeah, I'm sure it tastes delicious. <laughs> no, it actually, it kind of tastes kind of mushroomy and kind of earthy. It's not really that, it's not unpleasant, I guess. I'll hmm. screw it up and drink the IPMO. <laughs> oh, yeah, there you go. <laughs> um, extra tightness. Oh, yeah. Tastes kind of like, mm, like kava, bugs. maybe. So that's uh, something that we're doing a trial on right now. Um, I don't know if anyone's ever dealt with blister beetles in the middle of the country, but they are horrendous. And there aren't really any good controls for them. Um, so we have a farm that I'm working with that uh, also has a soil area and goats and stuff outside, and they're dealing with a plague of them right now. So we're, we're going to be doing an IMO, uh, IPMO trial on that um, with the blister beetles with collected blister beetles as the insect frass component and see how that goes um, in terms of uh, control. See if it does anything, you know, it's worth a try. If nothing else works, it's, it's worth a shot in the dark, you know? Oh yeah, definitely. That's really cool. So you're collecting the blister beetles to, I'm not super familiar with an I am, what do you call it? An IPMO or? Yeah. So, so basically you do an IMO collection, same as you would in traditional can -F. You're familiar with that? just because of chris trump's class in mycelia i mean i know i know just the first imo step but i didn't know that there was like all of the subsequent yeah so okay so initially let me find a okay i'll just throw up a thing here give me two seconds i can pull up something but basically um initially you want to i think on which one i want so initially you Okay, so you have your, your rice. Uh, in an IMO, you have rice that you're going to cook until it's like 80, 85% done. And then, hold on, I can pull that up. Um, put it in a box. And then you're, you're going to take that and put it in a box and then do a forest collection on it um, from there. And I would assume that you want to like get into like a an established of an ecosystem as possible, like an older growth forest would probably have the Absolutely. most- Absolutely, as old and undisturbed as possible. Um, some people recommend the tops of the tops of hills as well. Okay. Yeah, so this is what your IMO collection is gonna look like when it, if it's a good healthy one, mostly white, maybe some other colors, but uh, the important one is not, you don't want a lot of black and you don't want a lot of green. If it's more than about 5% green trichoderma, it's that's going to take over and you don't want that. So like just you can put it in a compost or something else, but don't use it for your, your IMO. 
um, just make more. And I always like to make five or 10 at a time and, and just put a bunch out and do a bunch of batches at once uh, and then collect them all and, and combine them. I find it works much better. And hey, I don't care if one or two of them uh, uh, fail or, or whatever. It's no big deal. Now, in a pinch, would you recommend somebody uh, maybe take out the greener stuff if they if they were just getting started and needed uh, needed to use some of their IMO? Yeah, you, if you had it just on one side or something, you could just cut it in half or take a portion, you know, the portion that's clean uh, and use the rest, but you still have that chance of contamination. So once you have that, that, once you have that component, you're going to go to IMO2. So you, you weigh out equal weight of sugar to the weight of the fungi and rice, uh, and then you blend it together and it'll stabilize into a liquid over, you know, one to two weeks usually. Sometimes it takes a little longer, but. Um, uh, and you'll be left with uh, a nice goop. Now, this is the, the sugars, uh, and the reason why you use brown sugar and not molasses is um, the sugar does a much better job of locking out the oxygen and, and basically causing those microbes to go into that spore form. Then from this, you can take that and either, there's other steps, IML3 and 4, which take a while to explain, but basically mixing it with bran and some soil and, and bulking it out. And then IML4, where you, you mix in native soil as well. Uh, to, to bulk it out. Um, they also, in the traditional one, would mix termite soil specifically uh, or anthill soil, um, trying to get some additional diversity to that uh, in a traditional can of. But, and then IMO5 is when you add a nitrogen source as well. So you, you can get really fancy with it. There, there's other ones past that, but. Um, okay, so um, uh, with IPMO, you're basically doing that same process, but you're taking that and adding, uh, replacing a third of the rice with insect frass or corpses of your target insect. Um, I got, I found out about this because I was stuck in Zimbabwe and we didn't have, when COVID happened, we didn't have uh, any good solutions. So I asked Chris, hey, what's, a, you know, is there any good KNF solutions? Because like we can make KNF stuff here. And he suggested trying this. So, and it worked pretty well. So um, definitely a, a good, um, a good option if you're trying to do things. And Chris has had good luck with it with scale. I've had really good luck with it with grasshoppers and crickets, which were our plague in Zimbabwe. Uh, in fact, I, I'm hoping that I can get a hold of somebody out. And, and I have a friend of mine that does a lot of missionary work in Kenya with agriculture stuff. And hopefully we can get a chance to try it against some locusts and something a little more hardcore, something I'm hoping to do. But, uh, but um, Chris has had really good luck with it with weevils and scale in particular. And scale is a hard one to treat with biocontrols, um, but it can be one that, that you could utilize this type of method. So they take that. And then they they utilize the uh, you, you utilize the IPMO. Uh, I usually use a, a, a teaspoon per um, a four gallon tank, uh, and then I'll take that and brew it up for um, twelve hours beforehand just to wake up those microbes uh, and, and get it you know in the water. And then we strain it and pour it into the, the the sprayer tanks, and then away we go. And then as far as sprayer tanks, for anyone that's wondering, um, the the cheap and it's not the best one, but if you just get one extra one for bigger facilities or just just know that you're going to occasionally have to replace parts on it. Um, let me find it here. This is the Rainmaker sprayer. So they're really good. The four gallon backpack one is awesome. Uh, this one, this is the one I like the best. Oh man, they went up in price. Um, they used to be cheaper. Um, they used to be like a buck 75, but I guess they're about 200 now. And the reason why I like it a lot is it has this nice triple headed sprayer. It throws a wall of stuff out there and it's just a diffusion disc. So it doesn't kill your microbes. It's really gentle compared to some of the other stuff for spreading microbes. Um, so we've seen really good application rates with this particular sprayer in terms of survivability of the microbes. Um, and so I'm a big fan of this one. It's the one model that I like to use the most unless we're at really big scales uh, in terms of, of stuff. But anything in the home garden or small or medium commercial scale, I like these. And, a little battery packs, you just, you know, charge them when you're not using them. You can get most of a day's worth of about, well, about four hours worth of spray and out of it before the batteries toast. So what do you, how do you like that compared to the Hudson never pump? That's usually what I use. And I feel like it's uh, a little bit cheaper, but I'm, it could have gone up. Everything's gone up in price nowadays, post COVID. It's like things have doubled in price and it huh. takes twice as long to freaking get there. Is it the pro you're talking about? The four gallon? So do yep. equivalent to equivalent? Yep. So it looks like that's yeah, slightly cheaper. This is about what the other one was in price. 
Yeah, that's what I have. Cool. I, I just got a dual, a dual head too. Yeah. Nice. Slightly cheaper. I'm always yeah. trying to find the cheaper things, but. Oh, that's uh, great. Okay, so IPMO, a quarter tea or one teaspoon, that's a very small amount. That's so what is it exactly doing? Like when you're taking the insect frass or the targeted insect bodies, like what's the what's going on there? I'll show you. So I actually have a couple pictures of this. Oh, you know what? I don't have the bee pictures on this. Yeah, man. It gives the bugs them jumbi flu. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so um, uh, this is what the corpses turn into. They just get covered in mo and molds. This is a little caterpillar or grub or something that fell off one of the plants. Okay. Yep. We have a bunch of them, uh, you know, all the little beetles. This worked really good on Japanese beetles last year on the roses uh, at the farm I work with in Georgia. Um, they, they collected the Japanese beetles off the roses made the IPMO and then reapplied it and it kicked the living shit out of the Japanese beetles the rest of the year. The roses were, you know, more, they weren't completely uncovered, but any of them that were on there quickly got molded. Um, so that was pretty cool. Uh, but it will kill bees. That's the thing I wanted to mention. Um, I do need to bring up my other, my other slide deck. I have pictures of, uh, uh, again, it was from the rose trial um, <laughs> where the, they were coming to pollinate the roses and got uh, Okay, so be mindful if you're doing cucumbers or tomatoes or pumpkins, maybe that's not the best thing to apply when once the flowers have set. But hey, if it's that or lose the thing, the cucumber beetles, eh, killing a couple of bees in your, you know, out of your garden isn't the worst thing you, you could do uh, to save the whole garden. Interesting. I use uh, Isaria fumosaria. Um, it's a strain of fungus that you can just buy. The Ancora PFR 97. Um, and it's what, what are, that's cordyceps is the type or. Uh, yeah, they actually uh, just reclassified it a couple months ago to cordyceps, uh, uh, fumus cerasea. Yeah. Whatever, however you pronounce it, maybe I'm pronouncing it wrong. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I'm, I'm terrible at pronouncing things because I read a lot. I don't listen to audio. I'm like a reader. And so I'll read things and I'll say it in my head a certain way. And then when I say it out loud, people are like, that's not how you say that. I'm like, well, <laughs> tomato, tomato. <laughs> the other thing I found with um, Isaria fumisteraceae and uh, Bavaria bassiana and Metarizium even is if you mix strains uh, from the same species, you can actually get better vigor, uh, especially if you're fighting things that are traditionally resistant, things like leaf hoppers and stuff that are hard to infect in general. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes we, and again, this is just based off of some work that I've done outdoors uh, and both and in greenhouses, uh, but it seems like that can increase the infection rate. Um, you know, again, it'll probably make certain IPM applicator people's heads explode and uh, uh, that uh, as far as mixing those products, but it works just fine. Uh, there, there's no problem. Just stick to the same species so they don't outcompete each other, but you're basically get, getting that like hybrid vigor almost that you get with some of the other stuff. But not all of them play nice, be mindful of that. But certainly if you are running into a problem, it can it can be an option if you're trying to figure out so a solution. So you're saying like mixing like Botanigard and Encora, like no. the two different strains or what? Yeah, so so mixing PFR 97 and Encora uh, and doing like a 50-50 rate with those two uh, for a single application or as, part, or as a third option as part of a rotation. So doing... And Quora, then PFR97, and then maybe blending them for, to have that hybrid in the application. Or they're not like in the same strain. I thought that they were no. identical. No. no. In fact, um, uh, let me pull up my, I have another deck that has that in it. Let me pull it up here. Um, but I, especially Bavaria Bassiana, um, let me pull it up here. Well, I know the Bavaria Bassiana, that's the Botanigard, that's separate, but I always thought that Ancora and PFR were the same and that PFR was just slightly cheaper because I started out using Ancora and then I found PFR and I found a company that distributes it even cheaper than anywhere else. It's like forestry distribution, um, but they've been back ordered. I've been like, cause that's something that's part of my IPM plan for a lot of my clients is, you know, incorporating all of the different, hit them with all the different sides, you know? So you use something like an insect growth regulator to slow down the molting and the reproduction. And then you do the zombie spores. Here we go. Let's see. 
Yeah, so this is a slide from having a couple of minutes for classes, but um, this kind of addresses the different, uh, why you would use different strains for different ones. The, one of them is EU certified, but also good for borers and weevils. Um, another one's good for borers and cucumber beetles, the ANTO3. Um, the, you have the GHA126924. Uh, and then you have the one that I like the best, which is the Bavaria Bassiana, oop, went back. Uh, Bavaria Bassiana strain 5339, which is the one in Velifer. By far, that is the most virulent. I've never had, is, is above and beyond the, the, the best current strain uh, that's on the market for Bavaria Bassiana products. I've seen that work first application against leaf hoppers that were immune to everything else that we threw at them. Um, cool. And that was a really big, you know, save, helped us a lot at a particular grow I was working with. So, um, definitely one that I would highly recommend if you're looking to choose which Bavaria Bastiana product. It's the most expensive. I'm going to tell you that up front. But it, the virulence of it in terms of infection rate is noticeably higher than the other strains. Okay, cool. That's awesome. So what about, can I see what you have for the PFR and Cora slide? I'm, yeah. I'm curious. Oh, sorry. What's the next one? Yeah, so this is the different ones. I don't know if I have the strains listed for that one. I don't think I do. Okay. No. Um, the other one with uh, metarhizium is really cool because metarhizium survives really well in aquatic conditions. So it'll survive in those uh, in the water for quite a long time compared to the other ones. So um, again, these are kind of like your main staples for, for rotations or sprays and stuff like that for bugs. Yep, definitely all about those. Um, so, but you're saying you could replace that with an IPMO or in conjunction. Yeah, so so I like to add it in rotation. So, and okay. especially if I'm doing outdoors, I like the IPMO because I can basically carpet bomb the whole field and I'm not, I'm not gonna kill anything that's not supposed to be there already. It's a natural locally derived fungi. Uh, it's not something that's gonna cause a huge imbalance. I'm not gonna wipe out everything that's not supposed to be there because that strain already existed there. You know what I mean? So it's a, it's a much more ecologically responsible. You can spray your goats, you can spray your children with it. And, you know, no one's going to get sick or, you know, get liver or kidney disease like they would with other options. So <laughs> it's, you know, it's safe, you know, you know, if it runs off into the local river, you're not stressing about it. You know, it's just a much more ecologically responsible way. And it doesn't work good against everything, but it does work against some of those larger arthropods that are very hard to control with any other types of me methods, grasshoppers, uh, stink bugs, um, scale. It's good for those types of things. Well, I'm excited. I'm going to make my first IMO and IPMO like next month. I was going to say this month, but there's only a few days left. So September, that's my goal. And I am really, really excited that we talked about this because any way that we can be more ecologically conscious and still kill fucking pests in our garden um that's been like a huge thing with me you know like these like you're saying it kills bees and you need to be mindful or it's toxic to fish if it gets into the waterways and but when we're growing for money like this is our livelihood you have to kill these pests in some way and so if there's another option to bring into that arsenal um that's amazing i'm definitely going to be making an ipmo and test it out Thank you. Oh yeah, no, it's, I think, honest to God, I think Chris's discovery is gonna be one of the biggest things that, to help agriculture in a long time because you can adapt it to anywhere. Like in Zimbabwe, we collected just the local ones. We, we paid a couple of kids a couple of bucks to go collect all the grasshoppers we could ever want. They filled up like a whole trash can with, <laughs> but uh, we had uh, you know all the insect frass we needed and we just made our sprays out of that. And it worked great, not to mention, those microbes and the fungi is just breaking down the chitinase. So that's triggering the SAR response in the plants. The plants are boosting their own immune system. Uh, you know, you're, 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 they're getting that free chitinase to help with the, just building their own uh, materials and all that. Uh, so it's really, really great. That's amazing. So cool, man. I want to go to Zimbabwe with you. That sounds awesome. Collect some grasshoppers, get some kids, spray yeah. stuff. Well, we have basically hired an entire village there to work for us. There's a, it was an old tobacco um, plantation, basically. And uh, they had a whole village there, which was basically the workers, you know, housing uh, back when during the Rhodesian days. So uh, we kind of just fixed all the plumbing and the electrical and brought it up to speed. Um, it was a lot cheaper than building from new, you know. Yeah, that's amazing. Wow. 
what um, and this is um are you bringing in aquaponics or is it mostly at knf um right now the project's on hold because uh, the canadian portion died of covid like most of our board died of covid so that's uh, uh yeah, on pause right now but it's getting reworked um, but, wow. but the zimbabwe sides yes we do have a nursery there um uh, that's aquaponics and then we'll have uh uh, we had 10 hectares growing uh, until COVID hit and then everything kind of uh, got complicated and then uh, I had to leave the country because there was a handful of flights left to get out of there or you're stuck in southern Africa until who knows the hell long when this disease is over. So uh, I came back because that was uh, didn't seem like the best idea to try and stick it out there. Um, when we didn't know how long that was going to last. So um, ended up coming back, but um, yeah, it's it's a great time out there. The idea, original plan was to build a large aquaponics um, facility there, and and basically give away the fish. Uh, uh, that was part of the deal with the company, and then grow just the vegetables and the crops and the cannabis uh, as a export or for local production. Um, the cannabis being for export, obviously, at the moment in Zimbabwe. Um, but we also acquired a, a former Johnson and Johnson pharmaceutical license, and we're going to start making. Uh, pharmaceutical grade uh, cannabis medicinals there but uh, again everything's kind of on pause right now until everything gets restructured wow well i'm sorry that people lost their lives and put everything on hold because that sounds like very impactful for an entire community um and i'm very interested in learning more about that and i hope that it boosts it kick starts up again soon very soon for you so you can get back out there and do the good work spread the word save the ecosystem feed people medicate people and um, get them off of pharmaceuticals how cool that you used you were able to get into a pharmaceutical license and then be able to take that and get people off of things like opioids and things like that and get them off on plant medicine. That's like a really beautiful story. I like how that turned around. Yeah, and we'll, we'll get things going again. We just have to get everything restructured in a way that makes sense for the investors and all that so that everything's the right way before we can start moving money back to Africa again. But uh, it'll happen here soon. There's, there's quite a bit going on. And Southern Africa, I think, is really going to be a big production in the global side. Uh, because you know they can produce cheaper than most of the rest of the world and still have you know a good quality of life. I mean, I know we were paying everyone on our uh, that, uh, that was working for us four to eight times more than they had ever paid in any job before. Um, so that was really good, and um, you know gave them kind of middle class income, upper middle class incomes for just farm work. You know, and that was kind of uh, game changing because you know minimum wage here is like astronomical over there. So you can uh, you know a little bit goes a longer way. Um, so it's good times. Oh, if you ever get a chance to, anybody that's listening gets a chance to go out and especially if you're an expert in some agricultural stuff or even just know a decent amount and are able to educate people in settings like that, do it because teaching them KNF over there and working with KNF in a place like Zimbabwe, they, they have ground that's been poisoned by all these NGOs, giving them fertilizer and fertilizer and fertilizer to try and eke out crops and the different famines that have happened over there. But the ground is full of, of nutrients already from all that or just from the richness of, of a lot of these grasslands that are very, very rich in nutrients as it is, but it's all been, you know, poisoned or whatever else, there's no diversity. So bringing about that biodiversity immediately gets that stuff super viable again. It brings those nutrients back quite a bit and, and really can make a big impact. And, and uh, hey, if you're able to translate a language and you can just take some of the stuff that's out there and translate it into a language that might not have access to it, do that. I mean, you're going to help a ton of people. And if we all do it, you know, it'll chain out, you know, so. Well, I want to go teach a class now in South Africa, living soil masterclass, way, 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 way uh, cheaper than it is in America, obviously, but, um, or free, go and teach a community for free. I mean, that sounds like work that I want to be involved with. Wow. You're inspiring me, Steve. We can arrange that actually. There's a, I'm actually in talks with the guys uh, over in South Africa right now about doing a, you know, some kind of regenerative, they do a big thing in, um, September each year, um, not for this year, but for next year, if they want to get together a big list of people. So um, yeah, that, I'll definitely keep you in touch on that one. Um, so I took a 
class through Holistic Management International, and that is through Alan Savory, who is based in Africa. Um, he's doing the resert, reverse desertification in places that are, you know, lacking water and mimicking the prey drive where they have taken out the stampedes and the herds. And it's just amazing. That really inspired me. Um, I, for a while, I was a vegetarian when I first got into environmental science because they teach you in America, oh, the cows are bad, the cows are the problem. And then I started taking these classes and seeing how they were able to regenerate the land with cattle in Africa. And it was just really mind opening to me. Um, and again, it's right there, that holistic view, taking in the whole picture and not being so specific on one thing um, if I had the opportunity to go to Africa and teach and help the world like that, that would be a dream come true. So definitely please keep me in mind and let's talk about that when it comes up. Yeah, no, I'll, I'll definitely let you know. It'd be great. Um, anything else you wanted to mention? Uh, uh, I know you also do some hash making and stuff. Do you want to mention a, a little bit about what your favorite hash is or your preferences on that? Um, I love hash. Um, I'm not a huge smoker since I um, had my son like flour. I really just stick to like dabs or edibles and I would prefer always having bubble hash or full speco, full spectrum extract in my edible because it just tastes better. I think than having the lipids and fats and uh, flour material. Um, so yeah, I mean, we make and it's again, always not having waste. So um, taking whatever your smalls or your trim and turning it into a value added product is like part of that whole regenerative movement as a farmer and making sure that you don't have any waste. So um, we've got, you know, freaking prices dropped out last year, like crazy in California. I'm sure Oklahoma's coming i mean it's not as bad as california but i've heard you know two years ago prices in oklahoma are like you could get almost three grand for an indoor pound and now it's like 1200 average price so you really need to make sure that you're like you know getting as much money as you can and in california people wouldn't even buy trim they're like i saw people videos of people just throwing nugs trimmed nugs in the freaking fire and in the like the wood chipper because it cost more to sell it because of the tax structure with licensing it costs like 150 dollars per pound in taxes just to sell a pound so these people grew all this outdoor and it's like they they couldn't even sell it so they'd rather destroy it and in my mind i'm just like that's insane like, that's crazy. And I'm not going to sell my weed for lower than what I need to make it at. So um, I just turned a shitload of my flour, my outdoor into hash. And it's been great. It turned out amazing. I mean, we've got bubble hash, we've got rosin. I've turned a lot of the food grade bubble hash into like edibles. I do gummy bears, um, have BHO, uh, sugar diamonds batter um i love it i love smoking hash over flour any day so um really nice my husband got the puffco fixed yep abracadabra i just posted on instagram um that's the heady head stash hash co so um we'll see what happens with it i'm working with a client in oklahoma on a processing license um he's got it we just got to get the hash lab set up and um yeah i mean hash is amazing i love hash i love edibles even more with hash in them so um i'll have to send you a, a care package i've got some orange cookies bubble hash infused gummy bears and i send stuff like that to all of my patrons too by the way so if you're looking for some help and you want some free head stash samples you should subscribe to my patreon um gonna wait on sending out any more gummy bears though because they all melted it's so fucking hot everywhere that people were getting packages of melted gummy bears and i like had the idea of making all these nice flavors like oh i did a cinnamon and cranberry 
and then uh, margarita with sea salt, and then uh, local honey and pear nectar. They all fucking melted together and was just one big <laughs> fucking blob of flavor. So lesson learned, I'm gonna stick to one flavor and I'm gonna wait until winter time to send them out again. But yeah. That's awesome. Uh, <laughs> excuse me, will you be doing edibles as well out here? Yeah, yeah, that's the hope. Um, you know, get that processing license. I'm pretty sure you can do anything like Keef and fused pre rolls and bubble hash and rosin and edibles. So we'll start out with just the bubble hash and rosin, and then, um, you know, all the food grade bubble hash that you don't want to press. That makes amazing edibles. I'm also trying to make lube. I don't know how to do this, but I love weed lube. I'm going to figure it out. And that's going to be my. <laughs> I know how to do it. In fact, we worked on, uh, we, we had it. So there's a bunch of African herbs that are also like um, sexual enhancement drug herb things that are, are uh, kind of gray market stuff. We worked on trying to get those into the mark, legal market all of the root herbs that we tested, nothing would pass any kind of microbial testing that would fly for cannabis. So we're like, we had to give up the whole project. But um, yeah, the, it's not particularly difficult to do weed the, 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 the thing is you have to decide if you're going to make it latex compatible or not. That's the big question. Yeah, I mean, personally, I don't want latex, so I don't care about latex, but <laughs> um, my question though is like, because it needs to be decarboxylated or active already, like, so then that limits you to like what, rosin or distillate? Yeah, usually, so for any product like that, it's much easier um, to make it from distillate than it is for um, from anything else. Um, you, just to get the dosages right, because if your dosage is radically off on packaging, it can get you into compliance issues. Um, so by going in with distillate and doing the batches, batches evenly, it's, it's just much, much easier to stay compliant. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, I was just looking at freaking distillate. You can get a liter of distillate for like $1,200 nowadays. It's like really cheap. So might have to just play around with it and see what I can come up with. <laughs> Oh yeah, and I found this carrier too for, for that. Uh, again, if you're not not going for the latex compatibility, grapeseed oil is awesome. Grapeseed oil, cool. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, we used to make an on you or in you oil uh, out of grapeseed oil. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. Well, uh, thank yeah. you. I've learned lots tonight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks a lot for coming on. Um, let me throw your uh, info back up on the screen so people know how to find you. Um, and I appreciate you taking the time to come on tonight. Um, actually, I guess you want to start off with your classes here? Let me get that up first. Yep. So September 17th, Denver. I, if anyone is listening and is in Colorado or knows anyone in Colorado, there's only a few weeks left. Please, please sign up. If it, money is an option or is like a problem or a hindrance, DM me. I want people to learn like I'm, this is a sliding scale. We'll work with you. Um, but it would be amazing. Um, we're not doing this class for very much longer. Hopefully, you know, till February and hopefully we'll be doing it in Africa. That would be cool. Heck yeah. Um, but yep. So the class great going on January, February, we're going to do Hawaii. I'm really looking forward to that, um, at the end of the year, but right now, these are the dates, September 17th, October 1st, October 22nd. Um, yep. Sign up. Come see some microbes, bring your soil. Awesome. Oh, so you'll, you'll look at people's soil too, if they want? Yeah, that's the whole thing. Bring your soil sample. All of the stuff that I identified and looked at, that spiralum bacteria, that was in a soil sample. And one of the, the, the thing that I love the most about looking at all these different soil samples is the ones that are the most um, active are the native soils are the ones that are just freaking outside instead of the ones that have 
potting mix that they buy and inoculate once a week with a purchased bottled microbial input, the native soil is what is like just teeming with life. And I just love that because that's my whole thing is like, just freaking grow outside, try it. Don't, you don't need a pot. You don't need to buy all of these bags of roots organic or whatever fucking medium you can just amend your soil and build the life there and there's a living thriving ecosystem already out your front door so awesome. yep and then uh, let me throw your website up here as well just in case anyone wants to find out more you can find her at uh, queenofthesungrown.com yep and this is a brand new website so um i haven't even really honestly explored it too much um but if you need to get in touch with me you can contact me there honestly instagram i'm on there too much too often that's like my vice i love talking to people on instagram people send me every single day people send me pictures of their plants and i love figuring out nutrient deficiencies toxicities what's going on problems in their garden that's like my fun time so um, hit me in the DM Patreon Patreon's a big one. That's like, I do a discord live voice chat once a week, Tuesday night members only. And we talk about everything from microdosing mushrooms to what's going on in your garden. Um, and then I just started the YouTube thing up again. So subscribe to that, please, and support me um, so I can make more cool videos doing silly gardening things. Yay. Thank you so much for joining us. It's been a really good time. Yeah, thank you, Steve. It's been such a great blessing to have you in my life three times this month, and we just met. It's like so cool. You're not even sick of me yet. No, I'm not. I, hope you're not sick of me. I always say you either you love me or you hate me. I am who I am. <laughs> but well, I know Jordan speaks. Oh gosh, get it out. Sorry. That's okay. Yeah, Jordan got me there for a second. Jordan speaks very highly of you. Oh, thanks. I love Jordan. Check out Growcast too, you guys. If you don't listen to Growcast, I'm sure they do. Man, Growcast, Jordan is like, like I was telling you earlier, he's become like one of my best friends. So he's just a really great guy, super humble um, and willing to just help anyone and really just about the community. I mean, I've never met somebody who just loves his members so much. If you are a Growcast member, um, he treats you like family. So it's a really good, fun community to be a part of. And um, yeah, it's been great traveling the country with him. And we, we were in Tampa just two weeks ago and had a little Fiat. That was funny driving a clown car around Tampa, Florida with him. I don't know if you've been to Tampa, but they're real aggressive drivers. I didn't feel very safe in that clown car. That's for sure. Thought I was going to get run off the road and smashed into a tiny little pieces, but yeah, these are all our fun times we have together. See, that's somebody's soil sample. How cool. And microscopes are very, very user-friendly. Um, they have like the one that I bought for the class is a teaching student microscope. So if you're interested in getting your own microscope, I highly recommend it. And I'm always down to help people learn how to use one. So hit me up. Awesome. Well, that's great. Thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Anytime. Seriously, I loved hanging out with you and talking shop. So um, reach out whenever and um, we can nerd out about more garden things. You're always welcome on Wednesdays too over on our other show, which is a little more laid back, a little more like uh, hanging out at a weed lounge or a bar with a bunch of your stoner friends. We talk about growing, but we also talk about weird history stuff and other funky, just interesting topics. So come, come hang okay. out sometime. And we're, that's like more of a smoking show, like yeah. you're smoking. Yeah. So that's, yeah. <laughs> last night smoking, we ended up going. a few drinks. Yeah. So Josh was talking about, uh, in fact, I'll just throw the memes up because the memes we made last night were great. 
Um, I would love that. That sounds really fun. Let me. Yeah, know. we make a lot of memes and have fun and make fun of each other, and it's good times. Um, there we go. I don't know. If, no, no, hold on. Oh wow! And about two hours long. Oh yeah, we just kind of people roll in and out or whatever. Um, but yeah, it was good times. We had fun last night. Uh, where's the other one? There we go. This is the one. I found this amazing picture of Gosh, and we had to use it for the meme. Nice. Super regenerative. Weed pizza. Love it. <laughs> Great meme. <laughs> Anyways, I, I have actually found some other fun pictures so for, for Josh that are even more embarrassing uh, that he won't mind. So I, He was I telling us last night he wanted a $20,000 pizza oven. Oh my gosh, that's a lot of money for a pizza oven. Wow. That could pay the awesome. whole African village, man, for like their whole year. <laughs> a whole fresh water system. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you could pay a guy 20 bucks, he'll build you a brick oven for that. You know? Right. <laughs> <laughs> in Jamaica, and then you probably seen this in Antigua too. They'll they'll take like um They'll make like a stovetop for cooking, like in the jungle or like wherever the grow is. So they'll make just like a square box of timbers and tie it uh, together with with the rope. And they put a bunch of rocks inside of it and they make like a little oven with a flume at the top. And then they put their pots on the top of it. So you can make like an easy, comfortable stovetop out of just like a bunch of bamboo, some vines and some rocks. And it, it works great for you know, it's not, there's enough heat dispersion between the rocks and the bamboo. It doesn't cook, you know, burn it up. So as long as you don't make the fire too, too big. So it's great, man. There, there's a, you can do all kinds of fun stuff with that kind of thing. I don't know how I got onto that. Sorry. Yeah. You don't need a $20,000 pizza oven to make some bomb ass pizza. You could put some bamboo together and find some twigs and it'd probably be pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thanks again for coming on. I really appreciate it. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Um, it was great meeting you, Wes. Um, hope to see you both soon. Have a wonderful night and um, sweet dreams. Nice meeting thanks. you as well. Peace. Bye. Well, that was great. Awesome. She's uh, super fun to hang out with. We had a blast at uh, Turp Flow and at, uh, at my Silly 8. So, um, and uh, yeah, thanks. Um, Cast for putting on such a great event. It was really fun. It's fun to hang out with Chris Trump and Matt Powers and uh, Ava, who was on the show f um, from from uh, a couple of weeks ago, and a whole bunch of the other awesome community out there. And learned a whole lot about mushrooms that I didn't know about, and uh, some of the crazier stuff that's going on right now. Kind of, it was nice to kind of get caught up to date on some of the different tech that other people are working on. Um, so that was fun, and. Uh, yeah, it was just a good time. It was a nice, just like she said, peaceful place. I know I went for a nice walk. Uh, everything was kind of just really crazy and it was really hot and I wanted to kind of cool off. And so I uh, went for a nice little forest walk and it was beautiful there. It's always, Pacific Northwest is always such a beautiful place. So that's for sure. Absolutely. Um, did you see Antigua busted that, uh, that yacht today? No, I didn't. I did not. Yeah, there's see some like $140 million yacht belonging to some oligarch in Russia that was parked in Antigua and they'd kind of like tried to hide it or whatever. And then uh, apparently it got raided by the Antiguan government, the FBI and some other neighboring <laughs> islands government all raided it at once. So, no, I hadn't seen that. I hadn't seen that. I'm, I'm sure that they, uh, you know, if there's any cash on that thing, certainly not there now. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would tend to think so, that it has a tendency to disappear down that way. Par parking fees. Parking. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Everybody, <laughs> everybody does well. <laughs> like even tide raises all boats, you know? <laughs> and uh, if you want to check out more of uh, Queen of Sungrown, she was just on Do Gross. She had a great episode with them recently as well, and she's been on... Uh, been on... Excuse me, been on... <clears throat> Ah, I'm having a hard time tonight. Excuse me. Um, Jordan, Jordan River, uh, Growcast. He's been on her show quite a bit. She's lots of great episodes with him as well if you want to learn more about um, Queen of the Sun Grown. Um, what else is new with you in your garden there, Wes? 
Oh, just uh, everything's going nicely. I'll be heading out here once we get off the show here and uh, giving them some water and stuff. Uh, I have some flow times AK-47 that's doing really well. And uh, I got some uh, I got some uh, Mac and Jack that is finishing up in the next couple of days here. So I'm going to be just going out and checking trichomes on those and seeing how seeing if uh, we're uh, ripe enough to harvest. Anyways, and uh, yeah, that's where I'm at. What's new with you, man? Um, just kind of working on um, a one-acre veggie project, which is pretty cool out here in Oklahoma. <clears throat> so we got a, I finally got the final floor print and everything for that. So I just got to, working on putting that into uh, SketchUp and all that for uh, doing final plans for the beds and the plumbing and all that. So working on that project, um, working on finishing up some other stuff for the Georgia project. Um, just kind of finishing up a lot of different stuff and then also working on uh, uh, went to go see Cheech yesterday that was really cool uh, That's shout out to the guys awesome. over at High Guys uh, I had met Tommy a bunch of times and smoked weed with him and he was on the show so that was uh, 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 cool but I never met Cheech so that was interesting that was uh, uh, nice to kind of to meet both of them uh, That's especially cool. uh, you know, every Christmas we used to put that on my dad would put it on and my mom would yell at him to turn it off because we to to whatever, and he would ignore her and just leave it on anyway. We laugh about it. It was just yeah. part of Christmas, right? Like, it was just fun. Yep. Awesome. Yeah. So it was cool to, cool to meet him finally in person and hang out with him for five minutes. Um, and uh, well, a little bit longer than that, but uh, not much longer. Uh, but it was cool. Um, uh, it was just nice to meet him and, and have that experience. And uh, they kind of did a cool kind of experience in the it's a, held in a place. It's kind of like a dispo for dispos. Actually, I actually have a video. I got a, um, I edited it and I set it to release and it like didn't post or whatever. And I don't know why. So I got to like re-upload it again. Um, there was like an error with the video or something. So, but I have the, I just got to re-upload the edited version. Um, but I have a, a tour of this place. It's super cool. So it's a, it's like a dispo for dispos. It's like a wholesale dis, uh, dispensary basically. So you can get cannabis and like, up to a hundred pounds. Um, you can get, um, you know, all kinds of different, like larger volume stuff for dispensaries. If you have a chain of dispensaries, you can get all of your stuff in one spot. They have all kinds of cool displays and different things too, if you want to get them for your dispensary and all that too. It's just neat. So they, you scan all the different stuff and they have like a counter in the back. So it's kind of like an Apple store kind of thing. Where you go through and buy what you want or an nice. Amazon store. And it's, they, they all have it all ready to go for you and you know, have all your paperwork. They're also metric compliant. So, you know, if you hate dealing with all the bullshit ass paperwork with that, it'll make your life a lot easier. Um, so they're pretty cool. Um, nice. Yeah, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get them on the show here at some point. Um, so I've been working on getting some other cool guests on the show. We got ATG Acres from Oklahoma. He's going to be coming on the show. He's got some really fire weed. In fact, I got the last of it in front of me in this bag um, uh, from the Turp Float. Uh, and then who else do we have? Uh, we'll have... Um, uh, one second, let me make sure I get his name correct. Um, we have Nigel Palmer coming on the show. Uh, we're just working on the exact date um, uh, on when he'll be on, but probably one of the weekends or one of the episodes in September. We're going to move the show up an hour or two for him just because he's on the East Coast and he's a, uh, um, you know, we want to make sure we can accommodate him a little bit uh, to come on the show. He's knowledgeable. Um, but he, for those of you that don't know, he's kind of like a, um, a Chris Trump type person in terms of KNF, but he's done kind of a di little bit different uh, angle on it. And I think it'd be cool to kind of have just the diversity of the KNF uh, exposure on that, um, uh, on the show. So I'm excited to have him on the show. Uh, we've had Drake on the show. We've had Chris on the show. We've had plenty of other KNF people. We had uh, Quan Con Femme from Vietnam speaking on the, the Vietnamese natural farming. So we love to have the different, I feel like every time we have a different natural farming person on, we have like some other new piece of the puzzle that we some new, some new little science or ferment or tea or preparation that, I, that it brings a whole new way of thinking about how to create things. And that's what I like about talking about all these different natural farming guys is that we've learned, you know, that was one of the things I really took away from the first region conference that Josh put on is, fuck, I needed, I have been thinking about this water thing completely wrong. This is like aquatic soil. Like I need to treat it like living soil. And if I treat it like living soil, a lot of my problems will go away. And if I started inoculating it with um, compost teas and with the KNF inputs, it really brought that biodiversity into that aquatic realm and, and solved a lot of the issues. I mean, 
fungal issues and root funguses are a complete non-issue. Like I don't even stress on that whatsoever because it's not a problem. If I hit that with labs and liquid IMO, that shit's gone, you know, or mainly liquid IMO, but Hey, if it's a little tougher, maybe open up with labs as your first salvo, but you know, it's nothing scary anymore. You know, they all, maybe this, this one viral that we have from cucumber beetles or we suspect viral or bacterial. We're not quite sure. Um, that's a little scary, but that's the only thing, like everything else, you know, the insects you can treat, you know, maybe if you got something late in flower, that can be kind of suck. You know, there's not a whole lot of options, but most yeah, other yeah. things you, you can treat in one form or another. Now it's not quite like the old days where, you know, there are certain things where you're just like, well, I'm fucked, you know, <laughs> burn it, burn the whole place. <laughs> People also really don't like it when you walk in and they have just a, a bunch of really rust and my damaged stuff. And you're like, yeah. Take clones off the stuff you want and trash everything else. They don't want to hear that. <laughs> or, hey, you're going to have to keep this room and veg for three or four more weeks so we can get rid of the russets before you flip them. Or, you know, any number of those scenarios. I'm sure a whole bunch of people have gone through that. So, um, you know, that's just, it is what it is. You know, if you want the products to work right. Um, I've also gone to places that hired someone that, like, was a mortgage writer to run a, you know, four or five acre facility. And, um, you know, was was better at breeding spider mites than just about anything else but nice. I, i've seen all kinds of different goofy stuff you know there, there's all these different types of things going on out there in terms of um you know bright ideas and things like that but most of the time if you just hire some people that have actually have some experience and you you get good biodiversity on your stuff or hey just learn the different biodiversity inputs that are out there you know that's really the, the biggest thing to it so I, i'm really exhausted i'm just kind of going yeah no worries man i, I apologize guys i uh, a lot of time in the sun today so i'm a bit exhausted and my brain's a bit fried um yeah man what else is going on I'm trying to think um i'm gonna try and make it to harvest fest in oklahoma if anyone's going um, i think it's going to be probably one of the last times i'm going to go out before I, I ship out um assuming that all the visa stuff goes through on time so um yeah hit me up if you want to come hang out in oklahoma um it's on the eastern side of oklahoma so uh, yeah it'll be good times um what else is going on yeah just excited to go to thailand in fact on that note uh this was posted by breeder steve earlier today that was pretty cool throw this up here so that was pretty dope so this is some of the plants that they grow that i'll be working at in one of the rooms anyway nice Yeah, excited. And then also just working on getting a bunch of uh, genetics registered over there and just getting everything into, into where we need it to be by the time I get there. So that's going to be fun. But yeah, just all the different technical stuff that goes along with that. And then just trying to make sure I get all support to people that I need to finish up uh, getting all their support to before I take off. So that's been kind of my week. <laughs> Coming back from a couple of days away and immediately into the fire dealing with all kinds of <laughs> That's the way it goes, man. That's the way it it goes. was really nice, though, to just get out of cell range for a little bit and just not think about all the running around and hustle and bustle and bullshit. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. It looked like a lot of fun. looked like a lot of fun. Oh, yeah. I had a bunch of, I got a bunch of battery powered lights and I had flowers and mushrooms in my hair and stuff. I seen, I seen, I seen it. You and Chris Trump there. Yep. Yeah. We rocked it. <laughs> yeah. No. Looked like a good ass time, man. All right. Well, thanks everybody for watching. Um, I'll throw this stuff up here real quick. Uh, sorry, it's been a weird day. There we go. Uh, let me close some of this stuff. Here's that website again if you wanted to get those uh, biologicals uh, that she mentioned. It's um, custombiologicals.biz. This thing in audio format. Anyways, there's a bunch of stuff on here. Snake balls, blah, blah, blah. Um, there's your Monterey. So this is like cheaper stuff oil X, basically. Or equivalent. Cool. There you go. Monterey horticulture oil. It's time and for me to re-up anyways. I'll try that. Coming out with us on Wednesdays, we have a pretty great panel. Wes and I have been putting a little bit of time into trying to get some cool people. Breeder Steve will be on this week. He uh, he had a last minute thing pop up and couldn't make it last week, but he will be with us next week. I talked to him 
uh, today actually about it. So um, yeah, that'll be good times. We also, you never knew who else would be on there. Um, so yeah. We always have a bunch of cool people. In we had queue. Brandon we had, uh, Russ on there last night and Chad yeah, Westport. Ru- it was a, it was a fun episode. Oh yeah. And, and London, London from uh, future cannabis project as well. You know, all uh, great time. Great time. Oh yeah. And Josh and Dutch blooms. And we kind of have just a bunch of other, cannabis content creators and, and people that we're friends with or, or cannabis people that we just enjoy the conversation with in a, in a format that's a little looser than this show. Um, we try to stick more only to the science and, and interview type format for the show. And uh, that show, we get a little looser and joke around and have fun and make memes, making fun of each other. And it's a little bit different vibe than the show, but it, it's fun. And uh, it's been growing steadily. Uh, it's a separate YouTube channel um, just so that in the event that I'm away or traveling or something, Wes can take over or Chad yeah, can man. take over or whoever. Um, it's not really about, the show's not about a host or anything like that. The show is just about the goofy conversation, the fun that we have. So um, come hang out, come check it out. It's a good time. Uh, again, very different format than, than our normal show. Um, check out the pest class. Um, I will do a discount on that for Labor Day. I didn't uh, I didn't put the code in, but we'll, 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 uh, I'll get that up uh, for next week. Uh, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll do that. And then um, uh, be sure to check out apmjclass.com. You can use coupon code LABOR now through uh, the 6th of uh, September um, for $75 off the class. Um, it'll be good times. And then the pe- aqu- aquaponic and living soil pest class is the pestclass.com. Uh, I do have more classes in the queue. The next one will be uh, aquaponic mineralization and nutrients. So if you're doing vegetables or cannabis or herbs or trees or anything really, um, it'll kind of cover all of that in a broad spectrum fashion with a lot of you know additional detail beyond what we have on the cannabis class specifically around other crops Um, so um, definitely check that out we'll have uh, that available here um, sometime before thanksgiving depending on when my recording time is and then we also have the uh, virtual aquaponic cannabis conference coming up the first week in november as well Uh, i've been working on getting some of the scheduling together on that and, and some of the speakers together on that we have some cool people um uh nigel palmer also be speaking that as well um, so definitely be sure to check that out. Um, and uh, yeah, um, just been working on that behind the scenes. Um, and then just trying to get some other cool uh, guests lined up for this show uh, um, before I uh, travel. Uh, it won't be a big deal for me to do the show at a normal time. So the show is not going to change times when I'm over in Thailand. Um, the only difference is it's going to be this um, like uh, 9.30 in the morning, my time. So I'll be like just waking up versus... Uh, uh, you know, late in the day. So that'll be the only difference, but uh, it shouldn't be an issue as far as to keeping the show on normal schedule. Zimbabwe, it was fun because it was 4.30 in the morning. <laughs> so that kind of yeah. sucked. Yeah. Yeah. But that's all right. What's this? Uh, we have a question in chat. If you buy red lights right now, what would you buy? Um I mean, for the most part, Spectrum King, we, I started working with Spectrum King because we did side-by-sides at, at Aquaponic Source against everything else. We, we bought I was a dozen lights or 14 lights. I think it was 14 uh, of the, of the light, highest end lights that we could get and just did a straight side-by-side with them in the lab because we had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. We had eight different sites on it. So we just rotated the lights through and did side-by-sides and, uh, and basically just scaled it off of the number of days of growth and yield. And the Spectrum Kings won. So that's the reason why we started working with them for the cannabis clients. Uh, and then um, I just kept working with them after that. And then uh, I've become good friends with some of their employees there and stuff. But they have the, the best lights as far as bang for your buck right now. Um, they also are waterproof, so you can spray them down when you're cleaning the room. Uh, you don't have to worry about, you know, any of the, the shortcomings that a lot of the other lights have. You know, if you over spray or something, you can you're gonna have a pretty bad day with a lot of your other lights, whereas these guys are, are pretty good. Um, and uh, yeah, I don't know. We haven't had a, uh, I haven't had any issues as far as any failing with the ones that I've used with any clients. So um, I can at least speak from the ones that I've used. Um, but yeah, if you're gonna build your own on the cheap, you know, you can definitely build your own, but uh, it just depends on how good you are with a soldering gun and uh, how much you're trying to save pinch pennies. That's all. Sometimes you got to do what you got to do, right? Hey, man, I used to build reef lights that way and, and 
sell them or build custom lights for different types of stuff. So if they have like one type of coral on this side and one type of coral on this side, we build like a custom light array and stuff. And that's how I got into the LED stuff and, and learned a lot about that. But we used to do LED lights back in the day when they're just the XPSs and the Crees um, for the newer ones that they have now. <clears throat> and what we would do is we would um, supplement them with UVAB bulbs like you'd use for reptiles. And that seemed to get really good um, results in terms of the, you know, the back end of the day uh, lighting uh, what we were putting together, but uh, that was a long time ago. But yeah, the, actually we have a, 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 on the wall behind me, actually there's a, a, one of the newer Spectrum King LEDs. They have a really nice flat scale one that's a little bit cheaper than a lot of the other ones as far as the low profile ones. And it's, uh, they have them everywhere from 340 or 380 watts all the way up to 1,080 uh, watt fixtures if you really want to blast the shit out of your plant. So Damn. they have a, a, a 780 as well. So you can get, a, a, you know, kind of whatever level you want. And they have a new point source coming out here soon as well. It's, I'm looking forward to. Um, I know we, I've been big fans of their 602s and 603s for a long time. Uh, their new model is, uh, is pretty dope. I don't, I don't think I'm allowed to say anything more than that without getting myself into trouble. <laughs> new I live model with coming their, soon yes yeah, so i live with one of their, their people full disclosure yeah um but uh the, the reason how we even got in contact with them is because they won the side by sides that we did so um, they have been very reliable for us with all the people that i do know i know at least two dozen grows that i've worked with that are, are running them uh, and, and haven't changed them out so um, they've, they've been very happy with them so and again, hey, I just like them for greenhouses because if you have a roof problem, your lights aren't trashed. That's the biggest reason why I like them for greenhouses because, because they are watertight and most of the other ones aren't waterproof or at least water resistant, whatever, the, whatever it is. But they're actually ULA rated so that you can insure them for that as well. Whereas most of the other waterproof ones don't have that ULA rating. Um, but if you have the roof blow open or a hail punch through, you're not you know, your lights aren't out from an electrical issue from the water, at least, you know. Pretty tough. Yep. Um, All righty. Well, um, I think we'll wrap up the show. I uh, appreciate everybody uh, coming on. Uh, we'll be back again next week. Um, we're going to do probably an off day show on Monday or Tuesday here soon. There's um, a guest that I want to get on for timing wise that I don't think we're going to be to fit them in on Thursdays because I've booked most of them already for the month of September, but I do want to squeeze them in. So uh, we will have Natasha from the Clock Association on for an episode. I just got to figure out which day works best for her. Um, but they do have their conference coming up at the beginning of October. If you're in Oklahoma, um, check it out. I don't know if they're streaming it yet. I'm trying to find out myself because I won't be there. I'll be streaming in for the, the conference for my talks. So um, <laughs> Uh, uh, because of, uh, of my travels. So it would be a good time, um, but we'll, we'll see how that goes. Uh, but yeah, they, they have a great time. Uh, hopefully they'll be doing it online again uh, like they did last year. It was a really good way to, to handle the you know people that could make it and couldn't make it uh, uh, kind of situation. So, um, And if you haven't checked it out, it is kind of a, a big wide range of different aquaponics specific uh, producers, mostly around lettuce production. Uh, I'll be honest with you, it's probably about 80, 85 percent lettuce production stuff, and then some additional topics and other things and fish and biosecurity and, and other things like that. But it is very much geared towards your, your standard vegetable producer and not so much uh, uh, anything really super exotic. But it's a, it's a great thing if you are wanting to get into the vegetable side of things. Um, it, it's one of the best you know places you can go and, and meet kind of a, a bunch of people that are doing it in the industry. If you want to meet a bunch of people. Um, that have successful farms or are doing research in universities and things like that. It's a great place to go and make a lot of great connections uh, uh, for sure. Alrighty. Um, uh, thanks for watching. How do people find you, Wes? I uh, think you can find me over on Instagram at Wes Engine and uh, over on That Smoke Show. Uh, please like, subscribe, follow all those great things if you don't mind over at That Smoke Show. Um, and you can find me over here uh, on, as well. How about you, Potent? Where should people find you? Sure, you can find me on SoundCloud, YouTube, iTunes, Spotify, all the things. I actually just finally set up a link tree today, so I have that on my Instagram too. Uh, you can check that out. But uh, spot, yeah, Potent Products, all the things. Uh, you'll find me everywhere. 
Awesome. All right. Well, um, like I said, next week we have what's the date for next week? The first. I forget who's on next week, but we'll have someone good. I promise. I just don't remember who it is. 